Congratulations to you. You have done quite a job in that. The other problem where people are getting killed is the highways, especially the Western Highway. Being from San Ignacio myself, I travel that road quite a bit. And there's a stretch between La Democracia and mile 36 that's very winding. And lots of accidents happen there. I drive that road and I could see the reason why. I am, I've been a professional truck driver for all my adult life. And the one thing I noticed there, if they would reroute the road, road along the electric lines, it's a straight line and it would eliminate all that turns where people get killed. Is there something that can be done about that? Uh, yes, sir. There is in fact already a project in hand to sort of reseal and reshape the entire uh, George Price Highway, uh, the formerly known as the Western Highway. So the funding is on tap through the Caribbean Development Bank and I believe the actual exercise should take place momentarily. My name is Dennis Tillett, Mr. Prime Minister, our First Lady, Mrs. Kim Simplis Barrow, and our County General, Honorable Roland Young. I stand before you in humility. Mr. Prime Minister, I followed you throughout your career, and something that really caught my eyes and got very, I got very excited about us, about it, is for Belize, a bill that you want to pass in the House for Belizeans to be able to vote from abroad. And I believe that we, you owe us that right because we have invested in our country for so many years. And as I looked at my experience, your cabinet ministers only have experience in Belizean affairs. Uh, but out here we have Belizeans that have a wealth of knowledge in experience in American affairs and Belizean affairs. And we need these people in your cabinets. And Mr. Prime Minister, if you do that, we have the resources out here, because as you know, if you need money, you can come here and we'll, we have many organizations that can help you to get this information. Well, well, sir, as you said, we in fact proposed a change to the constitution of our country that would allow our Belizean citizens uh, with dual nationality to come home and serve in the government. I'm afraid we took a tremendous stick licking for it. Um, the opposition was completely against it. All the media were against it. Uh, funnily enough, even the social partners appeared to be against it, and we had to retreat. Uh, I hope we've retreated to come again, but for sure, because the amendment of the Constitution is required for such a law to be effected, given the slimness of our majority, there would have to be bipartisan agreement and support. We don't, when you amend your constitution, you require a particular majority. You require, uh, in cases where the change is fundamental, a three-fourths majority in the House of Representatives. In other cases, a two-thirds. We have neither. We're just 17 to 14. So there's no way we can amend the constitution except the opposition would agree to join with us in this regard. And somehow, sir, I don't think they'll ever do that. So we remain, we remain firm supporters of this idea, which we proposed in the first instance, but I can't tell you that we will be able to implement it in the current circumstances, unfortunately. My name is Polly Lawrence, and um, good afternoon, Prime Minister, First Lady, Council General. Um, I would like to know, since you mentioned that tourism is, is such a wonderful growth in Belize, what about investment or investing in Air Belize? And when it happens, please do not forget the Belizean Americans in stock and, stocks and bonds. Well, there's not a, 
there's not a stock market yet in Belize, although we're, we're looking to try to develop one. In terms of tourism, uh, it's wide open. Uh, you would have to go for yourself to see what particular niches might be available for yourself and for others that are interested. But there seems to be the potential for pretty much unlimited growth in tourism and, and again you're looking at a very diverse range of opportunities. Um, uh, the Norwegian cruise line new terminal in the south will see the Mayan villages getting involved as, as suppliers uh, um, and, and really uh, apart from making the point that the opportunities are legion, uh, I would have to invite you to actually get in touch with the Belize Tourism Board or, or, or go home and, and look at the situation on the ground uh, to determine how best you might place that opportunity. I believe Ms. Um, Mrs. Arlette Gomez is here. She is the person who heads the diaspora desk in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she is always uh, available to assist with inquiries and to facilitate any interest on the part of Belizeans uh, to do something for home. Thank you. My name is Robert Clinton, and thank you for taking my question, Mr. Prime Minister. <clears throat> my question has to do more with policy than politics, and it centers around uh, marijuana. I'm concerned about the fact that uh, while two of the well-known and legal drugs, namely alcohol and tobacco, are widely used. These are causing havoc in the health of the Belizean people. Uh, yet there seem to be a disproportionate amount of resources being spent on the control, production, and criminalization of marijuana. This to me is creating a whole new set of uh, young people who are in the criminal justice system and hence in the prisons uh, for marijuana. As you can see, a lot of, most of the states here are, are, marijuana is now legal. And I'm wondering when will Belize move towards legalization? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> sir, uh, either I haven't been following the developments here in the States closely enough or I haven't yet learned to count because I certainly was not of the opinion that most <laughs> of the states have legalized marijuana. I know there are some states, but I don't think that it's at all the majority. And I was at a summit in Costa Rica a few months ago with your president, and he made clear that at the federal level, it ain't about to happen. So I don't think uh, that any notion that there is an intention here to legalize it federally can be used as any sort of signpost for Belize. But I do sympathize with your question in this sense. I personally believe that the recreational use of marijuana ought not to be criminally sanctioned. I, I agree with you that we should be devoting police resources to the sorts of crimes that really merit that kind of attention. But sir, in Belize, you've left a society that is particularly conservative. The government appointed a committee to look at this issue and to make recommendations, not even for the decriminalization of possession of small amounts of marijuana, 
but merely to examine the issue of whether such possession should result in jail time. And no sooner had, had I announced, or had we announced the formation of the commission to do, more than, to do no more than conduct a study, then I was called by the head of the Council of Churches and asked for an immediate emergency meeting to discuss the development. I had to say to the good reverend, but sir, what is there to discuss? The committee has not even had a first meeting. There are no recommendations. What can I tell you? Discuss the fact that the committee has been set up. Could you not wait until the recommendations are forthcoming and then uh, surely there would be a basis for discussion. Uh, their reaction naturally is because the churches are adamantly opposed to any notion of even lessening the penalties for marijuana possession. And I'm afraid the churches are still an extremely powerful voice in our country. So uh, the committee is still extant, still, still in existence. I do hope that they will come up with recommendations and that those recommendations can at least form the basis of some debate. But that's a far cry, sir, from uh, the legalization that you propose. I don't think that's about to happen anytime soon. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister, Ambassador, Mrs. Barrow. I want to first applaud your grand um, interest and investment in making Belize a model. My concern and question to you is the public service and its efficiency, which has to support all the increasing um, developments, the economic development, social development. There is no way we could just bypass the inefficiency of uh, the public service. So my question to you is, what kinds of programs are in place for the training and empowerment of public officers to deliver better customer service efficiently. Thank you, Ms. Matilda, who in fact was herself a model civil servant uh, in Belize, a model public officer. The Ministry of the Public Service, uh, in fact, does have a plan for training and public service development. The minister is on a countrywide tour even as we speak. And this is with a view to trying to address some of the physical shortcomings, especially in the district areas, in terms of the premises uh, the offices of, of, of public, the, the buildings and, and the condition of repair or disrepair in which so many are to be found. Uh, generally terms and conditions of service, um, your, your allowances that uh, clearly need to be reviewed in order to keep pace with the times. But as well, it is to talk about training opportunities and to try to sharpen the focus of the Ministry of the Public Service in that regard. Uh, one of the difficulties, quite frankly, <laughs> is in getting the active cooperation of the Public Service Union. I remember having a meeting with them and making the point that if we're supposed to better serve 
the public, there is a need for training, there is a need for the union to recognize that what's happening in lands and in various other places uh, can't be allowed to continue. And for the public service union to understand that while it is there to help to protect the rights of its members, there is a larger picture. The response was not negative, but trying to actually make the word flesh, so to speak, proves to be extremely difficult. Government has appointed a liaison between the public and the private sectors, Mrs. Amparo Masson. And again, this was because of a perceived need since the private sector is convinced that the public sector does not operate with the level of efficiency that's necessary to empower private enterprise and, and the kind of economic growth uh, that we wish. In the context of what she has been finding out and particular problems and issues that she has been able to identify, again, the idea is to try and address those. So there is a kind of menu of, of options uh, that we're looking at, uh, including the training that's so desperately needed. But in fairness, I don't think we've come up with the kind of laser sharp, comprehensive program that will be required to take the public service forward. Um, uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's something, the Minister of the Public Service is a, an ex-public officer himself, Charles Gibson, who was archivist and then CEO. Uh, it's, it's something that I believe will require rather more than has so far been forthcoming or, or for the thoughts that are there and the plans that exist to be whipped into shape and, and reduced perhaps to, to one overarching document that somebody like you can look at uh, and, and be able to say, aha, uh -huh, uh, this will probably do the trick. I, I should, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to quarrel with the union at all, but it has struck me that while again, you know we're at an impasse with the unions, the Public Service Union and the Belize National Teachers Union, over the question of salary increases, we've made a commitment for 50% of any increase in recurring revenue to go to the public servants and the teachers as a salary increase. They want more or they want a floor. They want not less than 6%. And I'm saying, I can't do that. I need to see what the recurrent revenue will be and what we're able to manage. But it strikes me that the unions don't do enough by way of themselves trying to equip their membership better for the roles that teachers and public servants, and public servants in particular, have to play. And I just want to enter an appeal because anything that I say here gets immediately sent back to Belize, as you know. <laughs> I, I, I do want to enter an appeal for the unions to do more than just advocate for salary increases. That's fine, that's, that's a huge part of their remit, but it can't be the only thing they do. And, and I do want to ask them to look with us and by themselves as well to look at this question of trying to do more in terms of opportunities uh, they might create for their members to be trained, uh, to go on seminars, to go on, and to have some sort of a continuing watching brief so that they can say to the public when they uh, demand salary increases that ultimately taxpayers 
have to fund, but you know we deserve it because we can tell you that the public service is doing an excellent job. I don't think we're there yet. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, in looking at the time as it presently exists, we have some 15 minutes remaining before we will be required to exit this building. The agreement was that we ought to leave here by 3 o'clock. We are fast approaching 3 o'clock. But you also alluded to the presence of Ms. Arlette Gomez. While I am speaking,